Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, Mark Humphrey is with us. He just made a trip all across the Midwest and visited some really cool broadcasting sites. Plus, information on FM translators and how Longley Rice may get you a translator where you didn't think you could get one before. Coming up on Twerks. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. And by Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. It's the show where we talk about everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And we're going to have a great show. We were off last week, and I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't do a show last week, so it'll be extra double good this week. So uh, how about that? I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm the host of the show. And you notice that I'm in the same studio that I normally am, but it's got some signage that it normally hasn't, and that is Telos. This is now called the Telos Alliance Studio. And that's because I have so much Telos Alliance gear in here that we thought, you know what, Telos? We're going to make room for a couple other sponsors, and and we're going to give you the naming rights. So uh, Telos, uh, Telos actually kind of pays for the naming rights, but we sold the naming rights to the Telos Alliance, the Telos Alliance Studio. So that's where we, whenever I'm here, it'll be the Telos Alliance Studio. And when I'm not here, when I'm out on the road or somewhere else, it won't be the Telos Alliance Studio. It'll be wherever I, <laughs> I am. As long as we're here, though, that sign will be up. So thanks a lot, Telos Alliance, for providing all kinds of fun gear and stuff we get to play with and the opportunities to uh, to talk about uh, some great tech from the Telos Alliance. All right, enough about me and that. Let's check in with Chris Tobin uh, in some unknown studio in uh, the New York City area. Chris, welcome in. How you doing, bud? I'm doing well. Yeah, it's not an unknown studio. I'm uh, in our New Jersey studios today. I was trying to be uh, somewhere else, but didn't work out. So I'm here today. <laughs> You know, over to uh, to one side of you, there's an XLR connector hanging down. I'm just worried that the electrons are dripping out of that onto the floor. Uh, let's bring it yeah, in. that one. Focus. Yeah, that. That's that's part of a wireless microphone. <laughs> but, but there's a wire. Actually, there's just no microphone. Actually, it's, it's if those of you who remember back in the day that the toilets used to have a tank above you, <laughs> this is what they used to use. That's for those of you who lived in the cities and uh, had that <sighs> thing, uh, what they called the railroad apartments. That's what it was. Yeah, My grandparents yeah. had one. <laughs> you, you know, actually, uh, I was in New York City and I was having dinner with uh, with a mutual friend of ours and some friends from the BBC. And I went into the the men's room at this restaurant and it had a water closet. I mean, it had the tank, the wooden tank up high, at least on the outside it was wood, and the long pipe coming down, and then the the bowl there at the bottom, and the, the, the chain and the handle. It was, I'd never used one of those before. That was pretty cool. Oh, uh, yeah. There's, there's several places I've been to that have that, yeah. But that was a common practice for a long time. Uh, yeah, that's, well, I always do that when people ask, what's this? It's a, it's a pull chain. <laughs> I must say, as, as, you know, the first law of plumbing, and and as you might think, when I flushed that toilet, man, that water had a running start. <laughs> it, 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 did a, it, it did a good job. Gravity um, at its best. Yeah, you know, here at our house, we've got one of these low, uh, low, ten, low flush. Um, what is it? I don't know what you call it. It's it's a very compact toilet. It's all fashionable and all that, and it right. doesn't flush worth a crap. <laughs> it really does. This is terrible. I'd like to put the tank up up high. That would, that would that would increase it quite a bit. All right. Well, enough about that. <laughs> we got the show off to a to a to a crummy start here. Let's bring in our guest because I'm delighted to have our guest with us. Uh, I've known this guy for the longest time. He's been on what a time before, and it's uh, Mark Humphrey. Mark, welcome into this week in Radio Tech. Hey, thanks, Kirk, and uh, hi, Chris. How you doing? Good hey, Mark. It's good to see you. Again. So, um, uh, Mark, when I met Mark years ago, I guess, Mark, were you at, uh, it seems like you're at some uh, Radio One stations in, uh, what, in Philly? I think uh, we first met, um, it may have been under the previous owner, but mm. I think I met you at an SBE meeting. Oh, I okay. was the chair okay. of uh, Chapter 18, and uh, I think you were there to um, talk about Omnia processors, surprisingly. Oh, wow, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That would have been uh, almost 20 years ago. I think so, yeah. 
my goodness. Oh my goodness. I'm getting so old. He was, uh, and, and, you know, like, like all of us in this industry, you've gone through a number of changes. Chris Tobin has, uh, I have two different radio stations uh, that have you know, come into part ownership here and there and sold them here and there. And, uh, you know, well, one stabilizing force has been the Telos Alliance for, for 20 years. That's been great. Um, uh, but we're going to talk to Mark. Uh, Mark took a trip across uh, the Midwestern U.S. and he had a chance to, to visit a lot of radio stations and a broadcasting museum, I think. Um, and then Mark has some uh, other ideas about uh, local radio and about FM translators. And the FM translators, I mean, I actually own, I, I guess, a, a translator. A friend of mine owns a translator. Our station's on it anyway. Um, but there's so much I don't know about these things. And Mark has got an interesting situation where he is putting FM translators to terrific use, actually really helping the public and um, an extending coverage area for an, an AM daytimer. So it, it, good programming out to lots of good folks. I want to hear about that and some of Mark's other thoughts. And, if usually, and as usual, Chris will have uh, his thoughts as well. We haven't gotten together for two weeks, so I'm sure we've, been, we've built up a lot of stuff since then. All right, we're going to continue on with the show in just a minute. Um, I want to tell you about our, our first sponsor, it's a new sponsor called Angry Audio. What a name, Angry Audio. And rather than me pontificate a bit, let's just take a look at a quick message from Angry Audio back in 60. It just occurred to me. I love that ad, but it's very visual. <laughs> and uh, hope you enjoyed the music. If you're a listener only, hope you enjoyed the music. So I'm going to need to tell you just a just a thing or two about what you just heard. Um, if you're if you're listening only, uh, Angry Audio uh, makes some amazing little devices uh, to help broadcasters get things done. Um, Live audio mixers, you see them everywhere, and some are so good, you may be tempted to use one in a radio studio. Well, sadly, they're missing some necessary features that, are, until now, have only been available on expensive radio consoles. Enter the talk show gadget. It's the essential broadcast features to, it brings these features to your live mixer, like a studio monitor volume control, a second input for listening to the air feed. Your monitor speakers will mute automatically to prevent feedback when any mic is live. And speaking of live mics, the talk show gadget even provides logic to illuminate the on-air sign, and hopefully hushing the hallway chatterboxes. Uh, LED illuminated push buttons light up for up to four microphones, and you can uh, uh, get the mix right and leave the faders in their places. From the powder-coated steel enclosure to the internal linear power supply, the talk show gadget is built rugged for the realities of radio. It looks great in your, on your desk, but also can be mounted in a rack cabinet or under the counter with one of the optional mounting kits. Talk show gadgets from Angry Audio. You can check it out at angryaudio.com. Angryaudio.com. Look for the talk show gadget. And you know what? I guess next time we do that ad, maybe I should just talk over the music. That might be a smarter thing to do. All right. Welcome to This Week in Radio Tap, episode 418. Chris Tobin's here and Mark Humphrey is here. And Mark, you went on a big old road trip and uh, you put some pictures on Facebook, but I'm, I'm curious about what were some of the highlights, the radio highlights from your trip across the country? Well, it was uh, technically a vacation trip, but uh, I just couldn't resist stopping at some radio-related sites along the way. And um, in order to bypass Cleveland and Chicago, and nothing against Cleveland, because I know that's, you know, Telos headquarters, but I thought I would, <laughs> yeah. you know, avoid the traffic and, um, and drive through southern Ontario. So I crossed over the border at Buffalo, Spent a night in Cambridge, Ontario, and then early in the next morning, I uh, got a, a look at the Hammond Museum of Radio. Oh. And this is part of the Hammond Manufacturing Company. And if you build little projects, you're probably familiar with the little boxes they make. They have die cast, aluminum, uh, plastic, little project boxes. 
And Hammond also makes transformers and, and some other components. In fact, uh, some of the older Nautel transmitters, maybe even the new ones, uh, have Hammond transformers in the power supply. So I had heard about the museum. Uh, it's open by appointment only and uh, made arrangements with Noreen, who's the curator, to, uh, to stop there first thing in the morning. And uh, it's actually a, a, an excellent collection of history. Uh, now, I do have some pictures on my Facebook page, and I think you can probably find them. Uh, just search Mark Humphrey K3XY, which is my amateur call, and uh, hopefully you'll find the album that I just posted about an hour ago. Oh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Got, I, I, uh, I, I, I didn't get that over to our uh, our producer uh, in time. He, 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 uh, Suncast, feel free to, to look that up if, if you like. Um, uh, Mark Humphrey K, uh, I'm sorry, what was it? Mark Humphrey in your call sign? K3XY, K3 Kilo X3 3 X-ray Yankee and, and Fanatics. And, and, uh, and by the way, we're gonna, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. So you, you probably got to oh, be on Facebook to see that. But also this Hammond uh, Museum of Radio, I just found the website for that. We'll put that in the show notes too. That's kind of cool. It's, it's an interesting collection. Uh, it goes all the way from the early crystal sets through, you know, the 20s, 30s, 40s, military, World War II, and they have some broadcast equipment uh, transmitting, you know, RCA, uh, BTA. I think it's a, a 1M. Uh, there's a fully functional amateur station because Fred Hammond, one of the family, was a very active amateur. And, uh, and that's, you know, there's antennas outside. Uh, a lot of old um, Canadian equipment as well. Canadian General Electric Receiver. There's a beautiful Philco Predicta TV set up front. So uh, take a look at the at the pictures if, if you have access to Facebook and um, take a look at the website. But uh, worth a visit if you're in the Toronto area. It's maybe about an hour southwest of Toronto, right along Highway 401. Well, Mark, when you, when, when you first mentioned Hammond Manufacturing, I was, you know, Going through my brain, thinking, have I have I heard of these guys or not? And as soon as I went to the to their uh, museum website and found a page that has their logo on it, oh, that's yeah. who Hammond is. The logo is very is a very recognizable stylized H. So, uh, uh, engineering friends, if you, if you go to that website again, we'll have it. Uh, the 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 museum is HammondMuseumOfRadio.org. That's an awful lot, but we'll put that in the show notes. HammondMuseumOfRadio.org. Oh, it's cool. uh, it's a nice stop if if you're in southern Ontario. So after and Hammond then, Museum uh, was in your, oh, I'm sorry, was in your rearview mirror. Where were you headed off to after that? Uh, I I kept going <laughs> going west uh, into Michigan, and it was uh, late afternoon when I got to Grand Rapids, and I thought it would be nice to uh, get off the highway and and visit Tom Bosher at uh, WCSG at Cornerstone University, right along the, my route. And he mm -hmm. was nice enough to give me uh, the tour of his existing facility, which I understand uh, they're going to be moving the station to a much larger building on campus uh, in the next year. But, um, you know, if you if you hang out on the broadcast list, I'm, I'm sure you know Tom's name, and uh, mm -hmm. he's done a great job there. It's uh, a kind of a collection of some older um, Logitech and some Axia. And um, I mean, it's a major station, contemporary Christian format, but it you know, does very well in, in the uh, female demos. And uh, as I understand, I haven't seen the actual ratings, but I, I think it's a, a major player in the market. And they've just uh, kind of outgrown the building they're in. So I... Um, I made a visit there, took a few pictures, got on the road, spent a night in Ludington, Michigan, on the uh, east side of, of the lake, took the steam ferry across the lake the next morning to Wisconsin. What? And uh, that's, what? yeah, they, there's actually a, a steamboat that uh, still burns coal. Oh, my and gosh. And you can go across the lake, <laughs> and it gets you around Chicago. And, uh and I forget how many cars they loaded on this boat, but what was surprising, it has enough capacity for oversized loads. I saw them put a, a big crane that would have required an escort if it were on a highway 
Uh, and yeah, again, they were trying to get around, you know, where they're go- going through Chicago for obvious yeah. reasons with, with that kind yeah. of a load. But yeah. so, uh, that got me across, uh, made a, a stop in green Bay to, uh, refuel and of course see Lambeau field and have lunch and, uh, and then, uh, sped across Wisconsin to St. Paul. One of the guys I worked with in Philadelphia, Jim McGuinn, he was our program director at Y100. He's now programming The Current on Minnesota Public Radio. It's one of their music uh, formats. They, they have a news network. They have classical music. And then this is kind of an adult alternative uh, format. And uh, got a nice tour uh, after most of the staff had gone home. So we got to walk around, look at the studios and not get in anybody's way. And I had always heard that uh, NPR, which is also American public media, uh, had some pretty nice facilities. And of course, the, this visit confirmed that suspicion. So you'll find a few pictures of those as well uh, on, on my Facebook page. And, when, uh, you went to, spent, when you went to, yeah. when you're at, at American Public Media, what uh, if anything impressed you about the facility? They they have some pretty new stuff or medium old. What, what's uh, it like? It's it's a very large facility for a public broadcaster because they're not only programming the Minnesota stations, but they produce shows like Hurry Home Companion. You know, that was the the famous one. Um, they have a satellite uplink. They have an operations center which is always staffed. Uh, where they supervise the transmitters and and the satellite equipment, but they have a very nice recording studio with big you know multi track console and recorder and mm-hmm. uh, just you know uh, a very well funded organization. And I I'm not all that familiar with how it got started, but um, you know those of you who who are you, you know the situation there. <laughs> so it's worth a visit if you're in the Minneapolis area. Just because they're a major programmer and, and, uh, and a well-run operation. Is, is so, that in the same facility yeah. as, uh, as Minnesota public radio, or is that a different yeah, organization altogether? Same, same building, same ah. building. And, uh, I, okay. I forget the street, but it's in St. Paul. It's on the St. Mm-hmm. Paul side. Uh, mm-hmm. so, uh, it was nice to stop in and see Jim and, and get the tour and, um, spend a night in Sauk center, Minnesota which was the home of Sinclair Lewis, the novelist. And um, I stayed at a kind of a interesting historic hotel where he worked when he was younger called the Palmer House. Some people say it was haunted, um, although I, I didn't see any evidence of that, but maybe you're not supposed to see the hauntedness. I, you, know, <laughs> you just feel it. <laughs> but anyway, maybe so. uh, next morning, uh, North Dakota. And again, uh, because... I'm a radio guy, a TV guy. I wanted to see the tallest tower in North America, which ah, is yes, yes, North yes. Dakota. Yeah. KGLY TV is, is the current call sign. I think it started as KTHI and the overall height, if I'm not mistaken, is 2,063 feet above ground. And it just happened that the transmitter supervisor was on site supervising a crew and they're working on the repack getting ready for the repack and they were, um, going up, moving some antennas around. And what I learned though, is that tower is not going to be the tallest much longer. Uh, and I forget, I think they were originally channel 11 in analog. I don't know the whole story here. So forgive me if I say something that's not quite correct, but the antenna that they put up for digital was not quite as tall as the original. They put a little pipe above it for the beacon so they could retain the title, you know, of the (laughs) tallest in the country. Sure. My understanding when they put up this next antenna for the repack, they're not going to worry about that little stub. And Uh they will surrender their bragging rights to their competitor, who's a few miles to the south. Oh uh, man! It's almost oh. as tall. Well, you know, I, oh. I I don't know who made the decision, but um, anyway, if you want to see the tallest while it's still tall, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or else you have to go to the other one down the road. But but anyway, it was it was fun to see that. It's a Klein Tower. It's been up since it was built. 
uh, without any structural failures, unlike the other tower, which I think came down due to some ice or I think a plane hit it once. I, I don't know the whole story, but uh, some of our viewers and listeners who are from that area probably could, could fill us in on that. Just to be clear, so for, that, that those, those yeah. call letters, were the, was that K-V-L-Y? Uh, v as in Victor? K-V-L-Y, and I think okay. it stands for valley, even though I, I didn't see much of a valley. I mean, it's flat. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, the I tower know. is about halfway between Fargo and, uh, is it Grand Forks? Um, they're trying to cover both of those cities. Yeah. And, uh, of course, there's no mountains in that side of North Dakota, so um, you need a tower, a big one. I've... I've got a link or two about this. I'll put that in the show notes as well. That, that, that's that's okay. cool seeing you know that you went to the tallest tower. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if uh, the people who pay the bills for things like oh tower insurance, I, I just wonder if 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 you go to your insurance agent and you say, you know, we've been paying insurance on the tallest tower. In, was it in North America or the, or the world? I believe it's it's in the North American continent. Yeah, North American. Okay, so we've been paying insurance on the tall. How much could we save if it wasn't quite the tallest tower? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wondering what if, what if the actuarial tables, you know, say, well, you know, you could save uh, eighty two thousand dollars a year on your insurance if you'd if you'd knock it down so it was no longer the tallest tower. Chris, Chris, Toby, you've been uh, quietly s sitting by. You have any thoughts about about wh why? I mean, we're just you know spitballing here. Why would a, a station say, you know what, we're not going to add that extra height after all and be, keep our title? Uh, lack of imagination, probably <laughs> new staff that have no idea what history means. Uh, what else? Well, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, when, in business of any kind, but we'll talk about broadcasting, it's all about how are you differentiating yourself from the competition because your audience doesn't do it for you. You have to do it for them and let them know why and what they get out of the fact that they're you know, participating in your delivery. So if you're the tallest structure, tallest tower, the tallest broadcaster in the nation, that gets his people's attention. They look at you like, oh, what's that mean? Why? And that's the hook. And then it's your job to make sure that what they sample, they stay with, you know, cum, time spent listening. Remember those things, you know, Nielsen ratings go to the Q factor. These are things that you use in business. I say this because there's a radio station on Long Island, uh, in the east end of Long Island, uh, in Sag Harbor, that has for many years uh, made it a point to make sure you knew that they were more than just a radio station. They were the broadcast house on the Redwood Causeway. And people like the broadcast house, yeah, it's the radio station. The Causeway, Redwood Causeway, is the street they're on. That's actually Redwood Parkway, but they call it the Causeway. And, mm -hmm. you know, they had all these different names and different uh, nicknames, I'll say, and different monikers, if you will. And that's how they managed to maintain the legacy of who they are, the station. I, and for those in the audience who do know what I'm talking about, you know already and you're hearing the jingles in your head and because they still do play jingles and it's a reverb and oldie station and, and it's community station. It uh, does everything local radio started off with 1929 in Pittsburgh. And that station I'm talking about right now is WLNG. 1929 would be KDKA. But these are hmm. things that make the difference. And this is why if you're the tallest structure, so let's say in New York City, people still fight over who's the tallest building but yet the only building that people ever remember when you say New York City, it's the Gorilla Building. Oh, sorry, the yeah. Empire State Building. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're right. But if you were a Malwright station back in the day in 1984, you were broadcasting from the Gorilla Building with the flamethrower. These are the things wow. you do. So, and so, that's what people um, remember. M Mark, can you imagine when word got over to the competitor uh, that, hey, we've just been given a gift? We did. We, we now have the tallest tower in North America, and we didn't have to do anything. Well, there you go. Yeah, but now oh, they man. get stuck with the insurance bill, right? Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but our insurance went up eighty-two thousand dollars a year because we now have the tallest tower. And I'm making that up. But I'm just trying to well, figure you know, out that's also why the cost of doing business. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Well, now now here in Nashville, there's a tower. In fact, it's the tallest tower in Nashville, and um. It still has an old um, uh, VHF TV antenna on it, transmitting antenna, but it's not in use at all. And they kept mm -hmm. it there when they had to swap out some antennas and go DTV in order to not have to change their height because they thought, you know, we're during this repack, we're having to move. We may have to do something later on. We yeah. don't want to tell the FAA we're lower now when... Later on, we may need to go back up for, you know, maybe the new antenna 
in 10 or 15 years will be, will be bigger than the one now. And so right. they just, they kept their height the same. That's a good point because as I understand it, the FAA doesn't want to grant permission to go higher than 2000 feet any, any mm -hmm. longer. You know, this KVLI went in before that restriction was imposed. So they're grandfathered. Uh, yeah. So yeah. At that, I'm, I'm sure they're going to stay above 2,000 feet. In fact, the tower, the lattice itself may just go up that high. Um, so anyway, it was it was uh, interesting. I, you know, I've been reading about the tower for years and finally got to uh -huh. see it. So, oh, but I, I just found some, some. I just found some data on it real, real quick. I, I, oh, okay. I do want to hear what's next, but I found uh, the lattice can, it, it goes up to 1,950 feet, and oh, then the okay. uh, now this is this is in Wikipedia. It may or may not be right. Topped by the transmitting array of 113 feet, so the total is 2,063 feet. The antenna weighs 9,000 pounds. The lattice uh -huh. tower itself weighs 855,500 pounds. Wow. Total weight is 864,500 pounds. Holy moly. And it's 160 it, it, acres of land with the guy anchors. Yeah. Yeah. You need a big lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that size exactly. tower. But, you know, they, they're planting corn out there, of course, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. making good use of the land. So, so uh, from that point, I headed pretty much due west towards Cooperstown, North Dakota. And by the way, this is my first time in, in the state of North Dakota. So I wanted to see a few things before I got to Montana. And I had heard that one of the former Minuteman II missile sites had been preserved as part of a state museum. And I could get a tour of the underground launch facility, um, you know, basically pay a few bucks and they'd, they'd show me what was down there. That used to be secret or, you know, restricted to Air Force personnel. So not exactly a broadcast site, but very interesting from a communications and technical point of view. And, and yeah, again, you'll see some pictures if you look at the Facebook album. What impressed me the most was, well, the grounding. They, they, they had to protect this against EMP, electromagnetic mm -hmm. pulse. And uh, all of the outlying silos that were controlled from this central facility, they all of the uh, wiring was done through something that resembles one and five eighths inch flexible line, except twisted pair inside the corrugated copper shield. They had a sample of the of the cable uh, on display there. And um, that was so everything would be grounded. Of course, those lines were buried pretty deep underground. But inside the bunker, they had a huge copper halo, a grounding halo, and all of the equipment. I mean, everything was grounded with very heavy cable, you know, with the idea that it could survive some kind of a um, nuclear attack up, up above. Wow. So if you're in that part of the state, it's, it's worth a visit. And uh, somebody else was there who's, who, he didn't tell me who he works for. I think he's with a defense contractor, <laughs> but he, mm. he, he was there for the tour as well. And he said he was passing through and was a ham. I forget his call sign. But. <laughs> so I, I have a question but, about, uh, about communication. Yeah. Uh, you, you said, yeah. you know, obviously a silo like this. Well, it, it, they have procedures, I'm sure, to operate uh, w when it was operating, uh, to operate in the absence of communications. But... Uh, I'm right. guessing they didn't want a whole bunch of antennas uh, outside uh, up in the air. How what, was it? Phone lines? How did they get communication between the yeah. silo and and they uh, else? they had a UHF antenna in a big radome on the ground um, to hmm. communicate with aircraft, and they also had uh, HF antennas that they could raise uh, out of the ground and. Um, I forget what else. Uh, there were probably some some microwave and and some other you know other equipment, but I'm sure they had some hardened facilities coming in you know by telephone and you know I didn't get the whole explanation of that, but uh, uh, I'm sure you can find the information online. But interesting to see, and this was all developed in the early '60s, so yeah, the equipment the. <laughs> The, the digital data was stored on, on very antiquated uh, devices, which you'll see uh, if you take a, a look at some of the pictures.
So hey, um, uh, we're, we're gonna uh, we're not gonna take not gonna take a break just yet, but uh, we do need to take a break shortly. And uh, okay. I, I and and I want to save make sure we save time for talk about translators. But is there another highlight right, right now that you want to tell us about your trip? Uh, let's see. Uh, I will mention uh, after I got to my vacation, my first vacation destination, which was uh, Glacier National Park. Uh, I headed south to Bozeman, Montana, and that was kind of the business part of the trip because I started working with a community group in 2007, 11 years ago, to um, help them apply for a new non-commercial educational FM license. And it's kind of a long story, but the original CP that they obtained from the FCC uh, it didn't allow for much power and the site location was very limited because it was one of the reserve band frequencies below 92 and they had to protect channel six in butte montana they decided to turn in that construction permit in 2009 and refile for a reserve channel above 92 in this case 95.9 which had been put on a special list and the reason it was assigned to bozeman was because of the nearby channel six and uh, so they, they were successful in obtaining a construction permit, but it took a few years. I called them back in January because I wondered if they ever built the station. And as it turns out, the CP, the construction permit, was due to expire this past May 13th. And I said, well, you'd better get going <laughs> if you want to, because you're not going to get an extension. And... Uh, they had a budget of about $25,000, and we were looking at building a Class C3 station. Mm -hmm. Wow. So kind of a tight budget. So I steered them towards uh, some, you know, competitively priced equipment. And uh, believe it or not, they got on the air two days before the expiration <laughs> date with a signal. Uh, the studio is not much to look at. But at least they're on the air, they're licensed, they have the necessary equipment to broadcast. They, they, they bought a, a Gates Air 3-kilowatt rack mount uh, transmitter and uh, an EAS box, and they're using a barracks with a wireless IP link to get the programming up from the studio. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was fun to see after working with this group. I'd never met anybody in person. It was all over the phone, email, and, and so forth. But I got to see what they built, and uh, I wish them the best. It's, it's, and Bozeman, by the way, is, is kind of a little boom town. Hmm. When mm -hmm. I was working on modifying their construction permit, I went back and looked at the population numbers when we filed in, 19, uh, or, or in 2007, and I was working with 2000 census figures on that application. Well, of course, now we have the 2010 census. And I was surprised to see how much more population is, is within their service area uh, that has come in, you know, through the last census. So that's, uh, that's the first uh, part of the trip. And uh, why don't you go ahead and take your break and we'll talk a little bit about Denver and then uh, get uh -huh. into some translator talk. Oh, yeah. You went to a cool site in Denver. I want to hear about that. Uh, okay. Hey, you're watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech with Kirk Harnett, Chris Tobin, and our guest, Mark Humphrey. And uh, Mark took a, a what sounds like a, a leisurely but fun trip across the U.S. and visited some radio and TV facilities. Uh, and Mark has uh, some very interesting things to say about FM translators and how he's putting translators to good use at his own radio station. So we're going to hear about that in, in a few minutes. Our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store, and they represent the line of Innovonics gear. And I want you to take a look at this particular one. You'll find it interesting. The Aaron 655 is the latest addition to the Innovonics family of rebroadcast receivers, designed specifically for FM broadcast translators, also referred to as relay transmitters. The Aaron 655 is unique as an uncompromising DSP-based HD radio and FM receiver combined with a powerful three-band audio processor and dynamic RDS encoder. IP connectivity adds streaming capabilities and a web browser interface gives you total remote control of the unit from any PC or mobile device. The Aaron 655 gives you maximum flexibility for program sources. 
Select program audio from analog FM, digital channels HD1 through 8, streaming sources, and analog or AES digital line inputs, all with assignable failover audio backup. The internal RDS encoder allows you to customize your RDS messaging. You can use incoming off-air RDS data, convert HD radio pad data to RDS, convert streamed metadata to RDS, or receive IP telnet data. Comprehensive audio processing includes gated and windowed AGC, a unique syllabic leveler, three bands of compression, and both wideband and independent HF limiting. Easy setup is achieved by using 10 factory presets and 10 customizable presets. The processor also supports day parting, allowing automatic preset changes to follow different programming formats throughout your broadcast day. The front panel has an OLED display and jog wheel with intuitive menus for easy setup, advanced control, and editing for all operating parameters. The Aaron 655 Dynamic Web Interface gives you total remote control of the unit from any PC or mobile device. A comprehensive set of menus includes a quick overview of now playing info, input-output control, processor options, RDS encoder, alarms and notifications, SNMP settings, and much more. You can also listen to the live audio broadcast streamed through the web interface. It is just awesome. The Aaron uh, 655 uh, from Innovonics. And uh, if, if, especially if you're an FM translator user, uh, that could be a great product for you to pick up over the air what you need to and then uh, reformat that data and get it back out again uh, into your translator. Thanks a lot to Innovonics and Broadcasters General Store for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, Kirk Harnack here along with Chris Tobin and Mark Humphrey is uh, with us. He is he's spinning a yarn about, about his travels <laughs> through the Midwest. And Mark, uh, after Bozeman, Montana, I've always wanted to visit Bozeman. I don't know why. I just like the name. Uh, you headed to Denver. What'd you find in Denver? Oh, Denver was interesting. Uh, I I got the grand tour of of the iHeart uh, Media facility, and they have a lot of stations in Denver. I think they're at the ownership limit. Plus, they have some translators that rebroadcast in HD two format. And uh, Jason uh, Gorodetzer, who uh, I've known for a few years, invited me to um, take a look. And we were there on a Sunday afternoon, so the place wasn't too crowded. So they're pretty impressive uh, studio facility and then went out to the KOA AM site. And of course, KOA is one of those legendary clear channel AM stations on, on 850 kilohertz. Used to be owned by General Electric and um, got a nice tour of, of that plant as well. And then the next day, uh, Jason took me up to his FM site on Lookout Mountain, which is... Um, you know, the major TV and FM site uh, up up on the uh, west side of the city and uh, got a look at that facility. And, um, you know, it, it was very well done. A lot going on there. <laughs> a lot of towers. And I didn't have time to see everything on Lookout Mountain. But I also got a look at the TV site just, uh, just to the south, which is uh, a combined... TV facility with several UHF transmitters feeding a, a common antenna. And what's impressive there is uh, they had to go through all sorts of, you know, zoning hearings and so forth. Um, and the, the local government put a lot of restrictions on what, what could be done and how it would look and so forth. They ran all their lines from the building to the tower through a tunnel. And this is really the first time I've seen that done. Of course, we, we normally see overhead lines on ice bridges and we, sometimes we see buried lines, but, but there's actually a, a steel tunnel made out of the same kind of corrugated metal that you'd use for a culvert under a road mm -hmm. and a bunch of uh, dielectric rigid lines going you know, out to the tower base. And uh, there are some pictures on, on the Facebook album that I haven't posted yet. They're coming in part two. <laughs> I tried to get them all loaded this afternoon, and Facebook was getting kind of sluggish. So, so you have to wait for those. But uh, so, what was the, what was the purpose of, of the tunnels for, for protection from the elements, or, or what? Yeah, just uh, protection against ice damage, uh, possible theft. 
you know, mm. it was it was just a, a more convenient way and an unobtrusive way to to get them out. And actually, the base of the tower is at a lower elevation than the building. You know, mm. it's down the slope a few hundred feet. But um, very nice facility, uh, very well thought out, in my opinion, and, and lots of room in in the building. So uh, if you get to Denver um, and you know somebody who can give you a tour, I happen to, to have a friend that worked in Rochester when I was in Rochester in the early 80s. We both worked on frequency coordination for SBE up there, and he was kind enough to um, give me a tour. His name's Paul Deeth, and I think he's with, is it KCNC? It's the uh, CBS affiliate in mm. Denver. Uh, I, yeah, I've so, been to Denver um, uh, a, a couple of times and, and got yeah. to visit eight, eight. I don't think it was at the same transmitter site you were at. I was uh, uh, wherever I was, uh, one of the public radio stations was up there. I remember they had a, uh -huh. uh, I want to say they had a Shively antenna that was like three quarter wave spaced or some odd uh -huh. Odd amount to get the pattern that uh, that they want, the density that they wanted, because they you know they didn't want the usual um, uh, uh, what's what, what do you call it? the you know the minima uh, where you right. have you know so much scalloping of the, of the signal because you know Denver's down there, it's not straight out, it's right. down, so they they wanted yeah. to make sure that those were filled in. Uh, but but yeah, what sure. a what a gorgeous mountain though <laughs> to, to see the city from and imagine oh, yeah. you know FM and TV signals just launching from that mountaintop. Uh, you got incredible coverage. I, I I wonder if you get into Western Kansas with some of those. It's just uh, amazing the heights you have. Yeah, it's uh, it's an impressive sight. And uh, while I was in Colorado, I I also took the drive up to Mount Evans. I couldn't get all the way to the summit, but that's the highest public auto road in, in North America, as I understand it. Mm. And uh, I got as far as about 12,500 feet above sea level. There's a, there's a lake just below the summit. And they closed the road on Labor Day, you know, the, the last four miles because of the weather. And uh. I'll tell you, the pavement doesn't stay very stable. When you get up that high, you get frost heave and, and so forth. But uh, that was fun to do. Wow, twelve thousand five hundred feet uh, is is that that's you know that that's the limit for flying in an airplane with without supplemental oxygen. Is that right? So, yeah, <laughs> above twelve five, you you. I mean, there was, there's a few minutes you can be above, but twelve five is is it at least for the pilot? The air was a little thin. Um, I <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. I would have hiked to the summit, except you know I had to get back into Denver and 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 visit some radio stations, but. Uh, mm -hmm. But I did do a little ham radio up there. There was a, there was a summits on the air thing on you know I made a few contacts and and actually got on twenty meters and talked to one of my friends back here in in the Philadelphia oh. area. Anyway, uh, on the way back from Denver, and by the way, I also visited uh, Chris Alexander and I guess it's his daughter Amanda, who's uh, chief yeah. engineer of the Crawford cluster in yeah. Denver, and Chris is the corporate director of engineering. And I had uh, used some of Chris's software in the past. He, you know, he writes some very good broadcast software for doing method of moments uh, analysis and so forth. And they, they gave me a very nice little tour of uh, their facility, which is very efficient. And I also visited Daniel Hyatt at Max Media. Mm -hmm. And that's a, uh, a pair of FM stations, which are actually transmitting from halfway to Kansas, <laughs> what you would call a, a rim shot. And yeah. there are a number of these in, in the West where, where the yeah. main site is, is out from the big city because the stations are on second adjacent channels to the, the ones that are licensed to the big city. And then they use boosters close to the urban area to improve mm. the coverage in, in that part of the, the market. So uh, that was interesting to see. And, we, we say, uh, yeah, then, we, we see, uh, I, I like to characterize those and, and Chris, you know, there's all kinds of movements all over the place. Whenever you have, yeah. well, the, <laughs> so I like to say there's the city of license yeah. and then there's the city of financial interest. Exactly. <laughs> and these are, yeah, the, these movements are, are, are not, and we have, of course we have some here in Nashville. They're, they're everywhere. I know you've got some, in, Chris in, in, in New Jersey and Long Island and, and, uh, you have plenty of move-ins, don't you? People wanting to hit that lucrative New York market. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a couple of broadcasters who've actually physically re relocated their their sticks closer to the city, even though the city of license is elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. 
I think, uh, well, actually, Z100 kind of did that. I mean, their, their transmitter was on the Empire State Building, but they were licensed to see caucus, weren't they? Uh, there was actually, it was VNJ, which I think was Newark. Newark, New oh. Jersey, actually. Still is. Okay. Yeah, the, yes, Newark, the original New Jersey has a few uh, WVNJ, VNJ FM was, uh, used to transmit from New Jersey. And um, yep. the station I worked for here in Philadelphia, WPLY, which is now WRNB, is co channel 100.3. And when uh, the construction permit was issued to put the Philadelphia media PA station back on the air in 1982 that opened the opportunity for WVNJ to apply to go to empire because they were able to work out a short spacing mm -hmm. agreement. Gotcha. And that, yep, that's exactly. how that all came exactly. to be. So, so, so Mark, so if you don't mind, we, yeah. we're not going to have a whole lot more time. I'd love to get yeah. on the subject of these translators. Uh, Let's cause you've talk got some about translators. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where'd you like to start? Uh, well, you know, there's been a lot of activity, obviously, in the last couple of years because the FCC had some windows open. Uh, two years ago, you could buy an existing facility, move it up to 250 miles as long as it would be used to rebroadcast an AM station. And then we had some filing windows in the past year for new facilities. That uh, And there were actually two stages where they first opened it up for the class C, you know, the, the one kilowatt stations and then the class D day timers. And then they opened a second window for class A and class B. And most of those construction permits have now been granted. And many of the translators are now on the air. But uh, in general, uh, there, there, there had been some controversy about all of this. Um, you know, the FM band only has 100 channels. 20 megahertz of spectrum and it's getting crowded in most major urban areas and uh so a lot of special engineering had to be done to make these fit using directional antennas uh, most of these are on either second or third adjacent channels to the full service stations in the market so it's possible to get waivers as long as you can show that based on the signal ratio at ground level, you know, no population is, is affected. And sometimes that, that's tricky. But uh, in general, I think it's been a good move for a lot of AMs, especially in rural markets. And I'm part owner of a station between Buffalo and Rochester, which is a strict day timer. We don't get any power after sunset because we share a channel with WRVA in Richmond, Virginia, and they have protected Skywave service in Western New York state. So we basically shut off at sunset. We get to sign on at local sunset in Richmond with 331 watts. That gives us an extra 15 minutes in the morning. But uh, here we are in early November, <laughs> We don't get a signal on the AM until 7.45 AM. And uh, then at eight o'clock daylight savings time, we can go to the critical hours power, 2300 watts. Two hours after that, we get the full eight kilowatts uh, take us you know, through the afternoon. Next week, you know, we'll be able to sign on at 6.45 instead of 7.45. But when you think about it, most people get up earlier we want to be there with a morning show. That's where having the FM translators has been a real blessing to us because uh, our main community of license, which is Warsaw, New York, is down in a valley and far enough from both Buffalo and Rochester that those outlying stations just don't get in and provide very good service. We're able to provide, you know, probably, well, no doubt the best FM signal in, in our community of license. And we also have a few outlying translators serving the three county market that we do most of our business in. So um, I will have to say, in our case, it, it was a, a very good move from a public service perspective, not to mention uh, it's been good for us financially. And uh, Kirk, I, you mentioned that you're involved with a translator as well, and I'm, I'd be interested to know, you know how it's worked out in your case. 
Uh, yeah, uh, we have an FM translator that just rebroadcasts an AM, and the AM is full time, although it used to be a three tower uh, directional array, and we couldn't afford to maintain that properly. So we uh, we refiled for a single tower, non directional. Uh, of course, that makes our power a lot less. Uh, hey, let me say goodbye mm -hmm. to my son. See you, buddy. I'll see you at Cub Scouts in a little bit. Okay. Oh, you, you, of course, you want to come over here and let people see you, huh? We're doing the show right now. Oh, all right. I'll see you in about uh, half an hour, 45 minutes. Okay. Okay. See you, bud. Have fun at Cub Scouts. Yes. It's a casual show. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, and, and you know, the coverage of the translator is uh, during the day is less than the AM, but at night it's way more than the AM because the nighttime power is next to nothing. Um, but it, it, yeah, we have people listening to it. So there's people listening to both the AM and the FM translator, but Mark, I, I want you to explain something real quickly. Um, uh, and we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I, during our pre-show conversation, you mentioned a couple of times uh, a measurement system for FM signals called Longley Rice, and right. this this helps give a more accurate view, I guess, of an FM station's actual coverage. And 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 that that's different than the F the FCC standard method of defining coverage. And you're able to use the Longley Rice method to show the FCC certain things that would allow you then to maybe have a translator. Could you just tell us briefly about how that works? Well, yes. Uh, the The method that the FCC uses in FM applications uh, to determine interference and service and so forth, they, they're pretty much still stuck on, on the old curves that were developed actually in the late 40s. Uh, the 50-50 curve and the 50-10 curve for interference contours. And that 50-50 means 50% 50 of the locations, 50% of the time, uh, and you get, you know, nice round, in most cases, kind of round contours. And the assumption is the signal always drops as you get further out. It never goes back up. You know, it's, it's just the further out you get from the transmitter, the lower the, the field strength. Of course, in reality, when you have terrain unlike North Dakota, uh, you have hills and valleys. The tops of the hills are going to be stronger signals than the valleys. Problem is most of the people live in the valleys because that's where it's easier to build and get water and run roads and so forth. So the, what, what we determine when we were building the translators, there's a very good website called fmfool.com. It's the companion to TV fool. And I'm not sure who put up this website, but they calculate field strength at a particular spot, I, I think they're using the Longley Rice algorithm, which does take the hills and the valleys into account. And we learn that our community of license only has two other FM signals coming in that exceed 60 dBU, uh, which would be considered primary service to a community. And both of those stations have some terrain obstructions in the way that uh, prevent having a line of sight path from the transmitter into our community. And uh, my experience has been when you listen to those stations, yeah, they're pretty strong, but depending on which side of town you're on, there's multipath. Our translator is able to provide a much better signal into the community than any of the outlying stations for that reason. Mm. So even though the FCC would consider it a secondary service, it's really, I think, a little more valuable to our local market than um, it would be considered, you know, through, through FCC policy. Now, the question came up, and we were talking about this earlier, Kirk, you know, translators do run a risk of being bumped uh, in the event that a full service station comes on the air or makes a modification that would prevent use of, of the channel. But perhaps the FCC might look at this in the future and uh, maybe provide a little more protection in, in certain cases. We'll have to see. I mean, there's been a lot of talk. Will the FCC someday let the AM stations shut off the AM transmitter and stay on the air with the translator? Let's see. As long as it's a secondary service, there is a risk <laughs> that something might happen that 
causes the, the translator to, to cease operation. So uh, that all remains to be seen. But um, any other uh, thoughts I, you have on translators you'd like me to I, I, I know because I'm I'm just so barely familiar with them, but, but this is a good time to bring Chris in and uh, and Chris, you, yeah. I'm sure you've dealt with translators in in the New York City market. Well, I've dealt with them from time to time. I mean, they uh, they work out well. I mean, Mark's right; it's it's a secondary service, and some folks choose to pursue and and use a translator to help their coverage, and others have uh, you know pretty much said no way because the, the risk is too high. Yeah, you know, it, it's probably time to start rethinking FM propagation and how the technology has shifted in such a way that what was once 1940s, 1950s uh, preferred yeah. method of measurement on receivers, state of the art, maybe was a new Vista. Uh, it might be time to rethink these things. And Long Lee Rice, I know I've used it a couple of times. I've got the, a couple of programs that are available that I friend of mine had that I got to use. Uh, it, it was very different from what the, what the 50-50 rule, the F-50-50 <laughs> rules oh, call yeah. for. In the regs, and you're like, wow. Uh, the, as you know, like you, they take those uh, Gallup polls and those surveys, it's the margin of error plus or minus 5%. Well, the margin of error between the two is like, whoa, uh, it makes the difference between, say, you know, a thousand dollar spot rate and a ten dollar spot rate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure enough. Hey guys, we, we're gonna take a, qu a quick break. Uh, and Mark, this is your this is your uh, two minute warning. Uh, at the end of the okay. show, we give a tip of the week. So throughout your travels or just through your work uh, there at home or at your own radio station, uh, maybe you can uh, think of a tip of the week to leave our listeners with. And Chris Tobin uh, always has a tip of the week, and I'll, I think I got one here too. So we'll try to figure that out. Hey, our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Lavo, makers of the Ruby Console. Let's check it out. Be right back. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at. But, have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features the jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments. Dual mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes. And enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo radio tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. Thanks a lot to Lavo for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. I got to figure out how to you know deal with this mute button. Uh, it's, am I that forgetful already? Um, we got some great sponsors on the show, and uh, the new one, AngryAudio.com, also Broadcasters General Store this week, uh, featuring Innovonics and uh, and Lavo. Okay, time for tips of the week, and I'm going to go first so I don't forget mine. <laughs> and my mic is open, and okay. I'm going to uh, remind you of a website that I got reminded of today during our SBE meeting. I'd kind of forgotten about this, although I've used it in the past. And that is FCCinfo.com. Mm -hmm. FCCinfo.com. I'll put that in the show notes. Uh, it's a service of Cavell, Mertz, and Associates. They're an FCC consulting engineering uh, firm. And what's really cool about this is the Google Earth um, file that you can download. It's, it's a KMZ file, and it's a file that uh, basically it has every broadcast license in it, 
and you can uh, put it, you know, bring it into Google, your Google Earth program on your uh, PC or Mac and click on on any any station's balloon, any station's little identifier and find out all about the licensing of, of that station. You know, the location, the uh, power, uh, if it's a, a directional thing, you'll find out about that. Uh, it is just so cool. And I, I've, I've used it before. I haven't used it in a while. So I just downloaded the KMZ file again. Uh, I'm going to play with it on Google Earth right after the show. So that is my tip of the week. Go to FCCinfo.com. If you just do a Google search on um, F- uh, Cavell, Mertz, and uh, Google Earth, you'll find it. But I'll put the links in the show notes for, for for that. All right. Mark, I didn't take yours, did I? Not yet. But okay. <laughs> uh, you're you're talking about the useful websites, and uh, that gave me a, a couple of ideas. I mentioned fmfool.com for uh, doing your own little Longley Rice study. But also, uh, there's a good website. Maybe some of you have used it. Heywhatsthat.com. That's spelled <laughs> H-E-Y-W-H-A-T-S-T-H-A-T. Heywhatsthat.com. And that will give you a uh, channel map. If you pick a spot, you know, latitude, longitude, or you can use street address and put in your height above sea level or your height above ground. And then you'll see a plot within two minutes on a Google map showing all of the areas that have optical line of sight. And you can also click on the map. You can get a profile of the terrain. And I find that quite useful for evaluating uh, different transmitter sites. It's Hmm. not a signal field strength predictor. It's, It's strictly a line of sight predictor, but you get a pretty good feel, you know, for the local terrain. Wow. Another site that I like for mapping, Cal Topo, spelled C-A-L-T-O-P-O dot com. And don't put www in front of it. You just <laughs> caltopo.com. That's it. And that has all of the 7.5 minute USGS quadrangles, as well as Google Maps, Google Satellite, not uh, sectional charts, you know, for aviation, in some cases, nautical charts, uh, open street map. I mean, any kind of map you can think of that's online, you can view in CalTOPO and you can do an overlay and you can kind of fade from one to another. You can do oh. terrain profiles. You you can do spot elevations just by moving the cursor, and uh, very useful site for any kind of uh, FM or AM or TV planning. If you're looking, you know, at potential transmitter locations, you want to get a feel for um, the terrain profile into a particular market, or just look at the topographic map. It's it's all right there, and it's free at least for now. <laughs> I hope it stays free. So caltopo.com. Yeah. Got, I got them both. They'll be in the show notes. These are both fantastic sites. I haven't figured out, uh, uh, hey, what's that.com. I haven't figured out how to use that yet. I'll, I'll, I'll play with that more. But the caltopo, you just jump right into it. And I can see my house from here. <laughs> That's so cool. That's yeah, absolutely could, amazing. What, what's your height above sea level? You just move the cursor and, and there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm about 800 feet above uh, sea level. Okay. Apparently. Okay. Just maybe just under, just under that. Wow. All right, Chris Tobin, what you got for us? Tip of the week. All right. Well, I have here a very handy dandy device. It's a humidity and temperature uh, device, a meter that is. Uh, a friend of mine uh, was doing a transmitter work just recently. I was helping him out with a TV transmitter site, and he said he found this online. It was very handy. He had his factory folks check it out, and it's pretty accurate. So uh, you can check out, uh, you know, humidity. Uh, relative humidity, that is, temperature, both Celsius and Fahrenheit. You can also, you can get the dew point. You press the button, get dew point. Let me see it back off. Maybe you can see a little bit of the display. There we go. And there we go, dew point. And you get the wet bulb. You can actually get well, wet bulb measurements here. And wow. it has memory up to, up to several uh, points. So you can actually recall. Uh, let see if I can show you this. Uh, there we go. Ooh, too much light. And we do recall. And then you can go up and down and get the different settings you've captured you can have a hold button so you make a measurement in the room press hold and you get the, the current reading it's pretty cool yeah. it has a built-in light too so you, there's a light 
And it has an auto timer. So when you hit the auto timer, it goes off 30 minutes of, you know, of not using it. Mm -hmm. so you save batteries. And it's pretty you cool. Can tell. So, you know, we'll, take, we'll take it apart. You can see the little sensor part. It's very tiny, but it's worth it. I wonder how, how quick it, it reacts if you put it into a different environment. Like if, if you stick that uh, in the exhaust stack of, of, a, of a tube transmitter, how long would it take to It's actually pretty in? quick. It's very quick. Um, I was playing with it this uh, this weekend on a transmitter exhaust stack, uh, intake and exhaust, and it was very quick. Uh, it, it was quicker than the usual, I think, was it 10 seconds? Usually is that the LM314 chip or whatever it is, 317, not 17. Uh, that The LM chip that people use, the temperature chip. Very quick. It's pretty cool. 55 bucks. Well worth so, it. Say the name of it again. Sure. And the name is... Uh, Pro Tmex, P R O T M E X. It does come with a manual if you choose to follow the RTFM approach, and it all comes with a handy dandy carrying case. There it is. Look at that. You just take it, place it in the case, zipper, belt loop, and off you go. Cool. So there you have. Uh, it. is, yeah, it's pretty. Would, yeah, it's would, really would, handy. I've been. Would, would that be the, the sixty-five hundred eight model? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the model is the MS six five zero eight. Okay. Mary yes, so you, it's, it, it's fifty-five bucks on uh, on Amazon. You can have it in two days if you like, or overnight yeah. if you're willing to pay for it. And I've been using it. I'm going to try it on my subway ride back and see what it's like with the <laughs> relative humidity, dew point, temperature. <laughs> you it. That subway gets pretty humid in the summertime, especially the, well, the air conditioning. There are parts of the subway in the winter time it feels like the summer. So, <laughs> the, you know, the funny thing is the new trains mm -hmm. saw so much heat from the air conditioning is greater than the older trains were. And that's where mm -hmm. the heat's coming. Stand uh, in front of one of the doorways. You'll feel it. It's a fast, uh, yeah. it's fascinating. Low oh, ceilings man. and the hot air comes right out. We got to go. Chris, thank you so much for that tip. I appreciate that. And we'll have all these tips and stuff on in the show. We got a lot of show notes today. That means we had a good show. Uh, Mark Humphrey, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate the effort. And uh, thanks for making your mic sound great. It, it sure did. I, I hope to come back again hey. sometime. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Well, good. Good, good to see you. Chris Tobin, as always, thank thank you. And uh, we got to, uh, next week, next week, a little inside baseball here. Uh, we're going to tape the show, a tape. I, I know, I know. Okay, we're going to digitally record the show on Monday of next week instead of on Thursday. We're going we're to tape the show on Monday. Well, you can probably watch it live on Monday, but it'll also play back on Thursday at the usual time. And the reason is uh, I'm going to be involved at the Ohio Association of Broadcasters with a panel discussion, and I'll be right. Uh, we'll still be in the panel discussion at showtime, so uh, I, I won't be able to uh, to do the show. So we're going to pre-tape a show on Monday. I'll put a word out about that. Uh, check us out on our Facebook page. Look for This Week in Radio Tech at Facebook. I'll try to put that on our LinkedIn page as well. And also on our uh, Twitter feed. So we have, if you look for Twert or Twert Show, uh, you'll probably find us uh, there. And there, there, we'll, uh, anyway, links to all that at thisweekinradiotech.com. Thanks so much to Suncast, our producer. Always does a great job. And thanks to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. And I really appreciate Chris Tobin, my co-host, for, uh, for uh, being available uh, not only today, but most days and Monday, too. So looking forward to that. All right, guys, we got to go. We'll see you next time on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.